Hello. Um, welcome to this uh, you can webinar. Um, I am Nora Carlson, and I am going to talk to you guys about noise and communication and actually a little bit of mobbing. Uh, before I begin, um, we are recording the session and it will be available on YouTube uh, after this is all done. So just FYI. Um, also, if you want to ask questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I will have access to that um, after the end of the talk, and I can start answering questions specifically from there. Um, okay, I, yes, okay. Um, I think I am going to get started, if it's time. Is it time? It is time. Um, so I'm going to get started. Um, yeah. So, hi, uh, my name is Nora Carlson. I'm a postdoc at the University of Victoria in BC. Um, and uh, so I am going to talk to you guys today a little bit about um, human noise and animal communication, but I'm gonna come at this from a slightly odd perspective. I'm going to basically introduce why I think and why I'm starting to be very concerned about noise and getting very interested in noise and how it interacts with animal communication through kind of the view of how I came to this realization and how I started to become really concerned about this um, in my own research. So we're gonna start off a little bit with my own research that actually has nothing to do with noise. Um, and then I'm gonna get into kind of what really made me start thinking about noise and then talk a little bit about kind of some very general overarching um, reasons that so many people are concerned about human noise um, in systems, especially when starting to take these larger systemic looks at the effects of noise um, on animals and on animal communication. So um, also before I begin, I'd just like to kind of throw a shout out to the University of St. Andrews, um, Kyoto University, and the University of Victoria, which are all of places that have supported me in various aspects of this research. Um, so let's get started. Um, also, one other really quick caveat. I have a bunch of uh, sounds in the beginning of this. They, I've been told they're a bit quiet over Zoom, um, so I will try not to talk over them, um, but just keep a, keep a strong ear out for some of these sounds. So to start all of this off, um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about how animals make sound, because trying to understand animal communication and acoustic communication, we need to understand a bit about how animals make sound and the kind of various ways in which they do this, the breadth of how animals do this. So generally, when I talk to people about or ask questions to other people about how they think animals make sound, many people very quickly go to this idea of a vocal apparatus, very similar to us. So something in the respiratory system that kind of has some type of closure that vibrates that produces um, vocalizations. So this could be things like pine siskins, um, where you have uh, these really interesting um, two sets of vocal boxes. So like many songbirds, they can actually make two different sounds at once, which is very interesting. Um, you get things like frogs. Um, and then mammals like us tend to use very similar ways of making vocalizations that we do through the larynx. So <clears throat> This is something that I think most people think of when they think of animal acoustic communication. Um, however, animals use a number of different ways to make noises. Um, and one of the other ways that they do this is through basically striking their body or somehow um, moving their body through their environment to make noise. Uh, and so this could be something like, I don't actually have a sound for this, but many insects will actually drum parts of their body against a substrate, so against a leaf or against the ground. Um, in the case of this insect, this leaf wing, they will actually drum their abdomen against leaves to make vibrations, to um, make sounds. One of the ones that many people are very familiar with is woodpeckers. So they basically hit their beak against something, and in the case of northern flickers, that something tends to be large metal poles at 4 a.m. Um, right outside your house, which is super alarming. Um, you also get 
uh, animals like um, beavers, if this will not play, but beavers, one of the things that they will actually do is when they get, oh, oh, it's going to play. <laughs> Maybe it's going to think about it. Um, but what they'll do is when they're startled and they dive, they will actually slap their tail really hard against the water and make just kind of like a plunk noise um, that's very specific to this particular action. And then many birds actually make sounds with their feathers against the air, so whistling in um, pigeon wings when they take off if they're startled. Um, but also for display purposes, this is a Wilson snipe that is winnowing, so it's diving with its wings um, spread to make this noise. That's quiet. It's even quiet for me. Um, and then you have the kind of another like overarching category, which is this idea of body movement or body moving within itself. So this is not a vocal apparatus, but it's very similar. Um, it's just the body producing sounds. And so this could be something like rattlesnakes where the modified tips of the tail. Uh oh, I have a hand. Yes. Um, Paul Shields, I am going to allow you to talk. You have raised your hand. Would you like to say something? You are muted. <laughs> can you hear me now? My apologies. Yes, yeah, I can um, hear you. It's, it's, uh, I was a couple of minutes late joining the presentation. I don't seem to have heard any of the audio clips. I don't know if <sighs> I don't know if anybody Why else is picking them sure? up, but uh, okay, I don't know if well, for me, but they're not coming through not, for me. I will attempt to make the noises. Oh. <laughs> this is going to get very interesting very quickly. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay. So, uh, right. Okay. So we have no audio. Sorry about that. Um, with um, some of these, I don't actually have audio. So for example, you'll have things like clownfish that will clack their teeth together and make this kind of like popping humming noise, like this kind of noise, which is hilarious to hear. Um, similar to that, uh, a lot of birds like roadrunners, for example, will clack their beaks together and they'll make this kind of tapping, clacking noise. In the case of these guys, it's very, very rapid. So it's almost like this, it's almost like teeth chattering when you shiver. Um, then you get rattlesnakes, so they have modified scales at the end of their tail, which they hit together, and that creates the rattling, this classic rattling noise that you hear for the, the tch -tch 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 kind of noise. When you go underwater um, and you hear all of this popping and cracking, uh, a lot of times in the ocean, that's usually things like snapping shrimp, so they'll snap their um, claws together a lot of times to create these types of noises. Many, many shrimp and crabs do that. And then I am going to show you this one video um, of a greater sage grouse. And I will attempt to make the noises as they happen because this is like the best thing ever. Um, and so sater, greater sage grouse actually make two different noises with um, their bodies. So one is they actually rub their feathers against um, their feathers. So they rub their wing feathers against their chest feathers, which makes this kind of noise. And then they have modified air sacs, which is part of the respiratory system in birds. Um, and they kind of fill them with air and hit them together in this kind of noise. So I will try to make these noises as it happens. If it, if it decides to start. But I feel everybody needs to see this because it's excellent. Okay, so you have this and then is when the two air sacs hit each other. And Sater Gray, say, greater sage grouse have one of my favorite displays <laughs> of any animal um, because I think it looks very silly. So basically animals use a huge, huge range of ways to make sounds. So it's not just the kind of the vocal communication that we think of um, when we think of oftentimes birds and mammals. Um, and so then the next question becomes when we're thinking about communication, well, why are all of these animals making sounds? What is so important that they are potentially putting themselves in danger of detection if they're prey to make all of these sounds? 
And so there's a number of different reasons. So you might have um, maintaining territory. This is one that many people think of, especially in the context of things like songbirds where if you are familiar with Amer uh, not American robins, British robins, so red robin redbreast, they sing in the winter and they sing in the winter specifically because they're using their song to maintain territory. Um, also, I'm sure many of you have heard recordings of wolf howls, especially multiple wolves howling together. And a lot of times these are used also to maintain territory and communicate to, to other wolves um, that this is kind of their area and they'll kind of maintain contact with neighboring groups that way as well. So I'm not gonna actually make those noises because I cannot do a, a bird song quite that complicated. <clears throat> um, you also get uh, similar to this and often also seen during the breeding season is um, uh, kind of mate attraction. So again, a lot of bird songs are used specifically to attract females. Um, and then you also get this in many fish species. So uh, plain fish, plain fin midshipmen, are very well known for this in areas that they occur because they can be so loud because they're in shallow water that you can actually hear them outside of the water in the spring. And they have this kind of mm, kind of humming that they do. Um, and then elk is another one of these ones where they're essentially streaming out into the um, air when they are in rut. And this lets the females know that where they are and lets other rival males know um, that this is also their area. So it's it's a bit of a, a mixed bag in terms of why they're actually um, calling, but generally during the breeding season. And that, if you've never heard an elk call, it is very strange and very high pitched, not necessarily what you'd expect um, from such a big animal and not one that I'm very good at doing. Oh no. Um, you also get a lot of calls in the context of movement. So you get a number of different circumstances um, where animals are maintaining uh, coordination. Okay, uh, where they're maintaining coordination or um, making sure that they're migrating with the right species. For example, you get a lot of these little like kind of noises when a lot of songbirds will migrate. So you get these spe migratory specific calls because a lot of them migrate in large, large groups at night. And so it's a good way to make sure that when they're flying overhead, the same species can join them, as well as making sure all the same species are migrating to the same areas. Um, and then if you've ever heard long-tailed tits, they kind of do this kind of noise. Um, it's not a very good impression, but uh, you will hear this very, very frequently as an entire group of these birds are flying through a particular area. Um, and this we think is to maintain contact. It's specifically used when they're flying. So you get these things called flight calls. There's a number of other species that will use vocalizations to coordinate or control group movement as well. So we know that white-faced capuchin monkeys, for example, um, will use calls not only to speed up and slow down a group movement, but also to direct the direction that the group is going. Um, so these are can be very important for these types of, of situations. Um, there's also a huge range of social reasons, or kind of this broad category of, of social reasons where they're not necessarily something specifically like breeding, but they're much more about maintaining contact or kind of mediating relationships between individuals um, within a group. So this might be something like recruitment calls where you're trying to recruit other individuals of your group to a specific area for a reason like food. Um, these could be communication over long distance calls to just maintain contact with other individuals in your group. Um, like you get with hyenas, they have this, these whooping calls, which are like the whoop, whoo, and they have a lot of individual identity information in them. Um, you also get uh, animals like alligators. So a lot of times you'll get lots of baby alligators will make this absolutely adorable chirping noise. Um, and these noises often uh, are used to synchronize hatching with other individuals, but also to communicate with the mother um, when she's protecting them when they're still very young. And then you get the classic examples of things like birds begging, um, where it's, it's kind of mediating their relationship of being fed with their parents. Um, and then in a wide, wide range of species, you have a lot of vocalizations that are um, used in, uh, to basically cement pair bonds 
um, in birds, in lots of pinnipeds, for example, and make sure that uh, individuals in large groups can find one another. So this, this individual, individually, ex individually distinct um, calls. So uh, pups can find parents, parents can find pups, um, breeding partners can find each other in huge colonies. Um, and then finally, you have a lot of these anti-predator contexts that you're producing a lot of these vocalizations. Um, so for example, you get these very, very high frequency calls in birds, is like, um, except much more high frequency than that. Um, and these calls are usually used to warn other individuals that predators are actively coming and trying to eat you. Um, so other individuals, um, kin and um, other individuals in the community can flee from those predators. Um, and then you get similar things in lots of different mammal species, especially a lot of scurids or squirrels and chipmunks um, will produce similar or calls in similar contexts. Um, and then you also get other types of anti-predator calls um, like this bird here um, and the, the top left of the anti-predator ones where you get lots of birds that will actually harass and attack predators in order to drive them away. And a lot of these, these calls are used by entire communities. So basically, um, what this is all about is the fact that we know that animals make a sound in a huge variety of ways. They make a huge variety of types of sounds, um, and they're incredibly important in their day-to-day -day lives. They're important for territory, they're important for breeding, for movement, for all sorts of media and social interactions, as well as for anti-predator function. So they are quite vital. Um, so I'm going to talk Next, a little bit about some of the research that I've done specifically into certain types of anti-predator vocalizations and behavior, um, and how that kind of changed my perspective a bit on the noise that we make in the world as humans, um, and what that might be doing to a lot of these animal systems. So the behavior that I study is something called mobbing. Um, this is some of my favorite pictures. This is something many people in North America have experienced before. Um, but mobbing is essentially a behavior where prey species will harass and attack predators, um, and this serves to drive them from the area, or it's thought to serve to drive them from the area um, and reduce the overall threat of predation, at least um, temporarily, if not over the long term as well. So what happens in a mobbing event is essentially you will get an, an individual bird um, like this uh, great tit, or sorry, this Japanese tit, and it will see a predator like this shrike in the tree on the right. And it will start producing mobbing calls and many of the other individuals in the community will hear these calls and they will join in to help harass this predator and drive it away from the area. Now, mobbing is something that has been around for a very long time. Um, it's something that we've known about and used as humans um, since antiquity, as it were. Uh, and so this is an example of, I believe, a it's either a Greek or a Roman pot, but on the left-hand side, there is a bird catcher. And uh, what they would used to do is go out and find a tree. They would paint the branches with something called bird lime, which is very sticky. And then they would put a small dangerous predator underneath this tree and the birds would come perch on the branches to mob the predator. And the bird catchers could simply catch the birds very easily, like plucking them off like fruit. Um, <clears throat> and I always end up showing this painting by Tobias Donover. Um, that depicts mobbing because I think it illustrates three really interesting things about mobbing. So the first is that if you look at this owl, it looks like it's having a really bad day. And this is very true to what we see in um, the wild that predators actually do not like being mobbed. Um, they will flee an area. So it's actually a very effective strategy. And this is why we think it is found all over the animal kingdom. Second is that if you look at these um, mobbing species, the prey species, there's many, many different species here. And although you can get one individual or just one species mobbing a predator, more often than not, what you see are entire species communities mobbing predators. So these big mixed species groups that are trying to drive this predator from a shared area. And then finally, if you look at these birds, all of them have their mouths open. And we think one of the reasons that mobbing is so well studied in birds is because it is very, very loud. And so it's very easy to find and it's relatively easy to study. 
Um, and one of the really interesting things about the calls that are produced in mobbing is that we think that the majority of them actually put information about the predator in them. Things like the size of the predator or how far away the predator is, even what type of predator you're dealing with or what the predator is actually doing, so its behavior. So <clears throat> I was really interested in trying to understand how different systems used this information and produced this information and traded it among themselves. And so one of my first questions when I started this project was trying to understand um, how do all of these different species come together to use this information? So we're pretty sure that um, if an individual starts mobbing, starts producing these mobbing calls, then we know conspecifics will understand. We think many heterospecifics will understand as well, especially those that are um, part of the main core group, main core mixed species flock. And we think that even those on the outskirts still at least understand some of this information. And what this does is it creates these large anti-predator information networks. And those networks is what I was really interested in. So one of my first questions was to try to understand how this functioned a bit in um, the mixed species tit flocks in the UK. And I did this with the Healy Lab and the Templeton Lab and a whole bunch of funding. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the first questions was, well, how are these species actually putting this information in their calls? Because there's a number of ways that they could do this. They could use call rate. So simply the amount that they're calling over time. So calls per minute, for example. They could use the number of elements. So in North America, one of the um, very close relatives to the tit family uh, are chickadees. So they're part of the Paraday family and they have the chickadee dee dee call. And so in that case, a chickadee may be a really low threat predator, but a chickadee dee 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 may be a really high threat predator. So they're increasing the number of elements in their call. You could also use the different proportions of different types of calls. So many birds have multiple different types of calls that they'll use when they're mobbing. And so in this case, you might have purple calls and green calls, and you might be more, um, you might give a higher proportion of purple calls to low threat predators and a higher proportion of green calls to high threat predators. And then the propensity might be different or the likelihood of producing a call across different mobbing events. So you much be much, you may be much more likely to produce a purple call to a low threat predator and a green call to a high threat predator. So <clears throat> I wanted to understand how the different birds in this system were actually putting this information in their call to see how they're using and trading this information and who's actually putting this information in their call and how they're doing this. So when we look at the six species found in the UK, starting from the top, we have coal tits and then crested tits, marsh tits, willow tits, blue tits, and great tits at the bottom. So when we look at these uh, birds, we find that some species like marsh tits and blue tits are using all four of these ways to put this information in their calls to differentiate between high and low threat predators. Some species like coal tits, crested tits, and great tits only use a few of these methods, but they don't necessarily use the same one. So there's no real consistency in exactly which method is the most useful. And then one species, the willow tit, does not put this information in their call at all. So we're already starting to see that there's a bit of variation in how these species are actually producing this information and what information they're producing. And this may speak to how they may be using this information or what types of information may be available in the environment. So what this does point to is this idea that there may be a particularly important individual, one species or two species that inform the entire species community about particular predators. And so that one individual's vocalizations may be much more important than everybody else's. And so I wanted to know if there was potentially a community informant within these six species. And so first I created a, a list of criteria a species had to meet. So this idea that they had to provide this really detailed information. So they can't just be screaming out that there's danger. They have to actually separate high and low threat predators from one another. Then they had to be reliable across mobbing events. So this makes it easy for other individuals to actually eavesdrop on these calls and receive this information. And so if there are 50 birds and you're feeling kind of safe, or if there's 10 birds and you're feeling kind of scared, 
when you're mobbing a predator, you have to still be talking about that predator, be putting this information in your calls exactly the same way. Otherwise, other individuals have to know way more information to be able to eavesdrop on your calls than simply how you put this information in your calls. So you have to be reliable. And then finally, multiple other species have to listen to you because if you're not being listened to by multiple other species in the community, you're not really a community informant. You're just shouting into the void as it were. So when we once again look at these six species, um, we already kind of have our answer to the first question. We know that five of these species, excluding willow tits, do actually differentiate between high and low threat predators. When we ask about reliability and which of these species do this reliability or reliably across different mobbing events, we see that only three of these species are actually reliable in how they put this information in their calls, regardless of what the flock that they're part of is actually like. And that's cold tits, blue tits, and great tits. And then finally, when we ask questions about who's actually paying attention, are multiple other species in um, this kind of wider community actually paying attention? to the vocalizations, then we start to see that actually there's only one contender for being a community informant, not necessarily an informant, but specifically a community informant. Um, and that's the, the great tip. And so likely this particular species is incredibly important in terms of its vocalizations and the quality and usefulness of those vocalizations for other individuals in the community. So I was still, after I did this, really interested in trying to parse out a little bit more about how these core species really um, integrated with each other. If we see this very hierarchical um, response, the same way that we think we do because we know that one of these species is really good at putting this information in their calls and multiple other species listen to them. Um, so I ended up uh, going to uh, Kyoto University with worked with the Suzuki Lab um, to try to get a little bit better insights at how some of these um, mixed species groups actually function in terms of how they're relating to each other and responding to each other's calls. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the things that we did is we did a number of playbacks where we wanted to see, well, who actually shows up in response? When, when one particular species is calling, is there one species that everybody pays attention to and everybody always shows up when they're calling? Or is this a little bit more variable? Is this something where maybe there's particular relationships between species, um, but not every species specifically comes and joins a mobbing event um, if one particular species is calling? So the way that this graph works, so we have the proportion of playbacks that an individual was present during a mobbing event and was involved in some way. So they showed up. We knew that they were there and they, they came and were involved. Um, and so the playback is along the x-axis. So that's going to be which species playback is being played. And then each color um, over here on the on the uh, y-axis, you can see each color represents a different species that's responding. And this is the proportion of these playbacks that they responded to. So when we look at coltits, um, we see that coltits pretty much always respond to themselves. And they're pretty responsive, or, or other, other species are pretty responsive to the coltits. So when the coltits are playing back, most species will show up at least three quarters of the time, except for European nuthatches, which are more like 60% of the time. When we look at another species, um, long-tailed tits, we see that uh, they get even more response from a larger number of species. So they get, you know, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the time you have all of these, these four different species, um, cold tits, Japanese tits, willow tits, and long-tailed tits showing up. But you start to get a much lower response by some other species in the community. So you get a bit of a lower response by varied tits, and you get a very, very low response from European nuthatches. So we're starting to see that all these relationships are not necessarily equal. So now if you look across all of these different species, we see that there doesn't really seem to be one particular species that's standing out. It's not that one species always responds to everybody super, super, super highly. It tends to be more that there are these particular relationships between species. So even though some of the, or many of the species respond very well um, to uh, varied tits. There's there's the one little European nuthatch that isn't responding very well to the varied tits, or that 
there's a lot of variation, for example, in which species and how often those species are responding to the Japanese tit, which is actually the bird that we expected to have the most response across the board. So we think that even though we think that there may be community informants in a lot of these systems, we think that these relationships are a bit more complicated and we don't really understand what would happen if we disrupted any of these relationships. Um, but we do know that these mobbing groups are incredibly important and that these birds do frequently respond to each other um, because this, this information is so important. So <clears throat> while I was doing all of this research, I spent a huge amount of time um, with headphones on and a microphone pointed at various places, both in vaguely urban places and very, very rural places. And you guys won't be able to hear this, so I'm not going to play it to you. But <laughs> um, basically, one of the things that I started to notice very, very quickly was the fact that I pretty much always heard something. I always heard a car. I always heard a chainsaw. I always heard a bunch of people talking or the drone of an airplane that I was frequently, even in very rural places, fighting to hear the birds over some of the background noise that I was hearing. And this drastically varied from place to place, but even in these incredibly remote, quiet places that I did some of my work way up in the highlands and in, in Japan, I was still hearing things like cars and planes. Um, uh, so this is a map that depicts a lot of human activity. So the red areas are urban areas, the blue lines are shipping routes, the green are global roads, and the white is air networks. And I think that this is a very good illustration of just how noisy the world can be, simply because all of these things are major sources of noise that humans produce. And when you look at the map, it becomes very obviously very quickly that there's almost nowhere left on the planet that isn't impacted in some way by human generated noise. And this is what I was hearing consistently as I was doing my experiments, was this noise encroaching on these natural systems. And so one of the reasons that I started getting more and more interested and kind of concerned about the broader implications of this specifically is the fact that we know that noise can disrupt vocal communication or any type of acoustic communication. And we know, for example, that if you do a playback um, of mobbing, birds will respond by investigating and mobbing. But if you pair that playback with noise, the birds don't respond, or at least chickadees don't respond. And this was a very interesting um, and timely study done by some of my colleagues. And it basically showed that, that masking was covering up these signals well enough that the birds just simply weren't receiving them. Um, and aside from just, you know, avoiding a predator or driving it out of an area, mobbing has many other benefits and mobbing species provide these huge benefits to the communities that they're a part of. So the reason that this is so important is that there's all of these extra benefits that are, are received by the community. So we know that there is increased foraging by a lot of the species that follow these flocks um, because they don't have to spend so much time being vigilant. We know that there's increased survivorship if you're flocking with mobbing species, we think likely because it's easier to avoid predation. We know that mobbing can assist species in crossing habitat boundaries that they normally wouldn't. So this can reduce the effects of habitat fragmentation, um, like roads, power lines, um, fire breaks, fields, all of these kinds of things, birds will cross that don't normally cross if accompanied by mobbing species and mobbing calls. And then we also know that many species can learn about new predators specifically by observing mobbing events. So this is a really low threat way to actually learn incredibly important anti-predator information if you have a predator that, for example, due to climactic reasons, is expanding or changing its home range or its um, its area into your area. And when we add anthropogenic noise, we start seeing problems because we know that anthropogenic noise can flat out start increasing uh, vigilance in a lot of species, not even necessarily um, species that are relying on these cues of mobbing species, but most birds will increase vigilance when um, encountering noise. And if you're masking mobbing calls, if you're covering up these calls, 
then you're suddenly losing this increased survivorship potentially and this movement across habitat boundaries, which are spurt like, which are um, started because of mobbing and learning about natural predator, or these new predators. And so it's not just that in the moment, this one mobbing event might be disrupted. It's that all of these extra benefits that come with mobbing are also disrupted. So <clears throat> acoustic masking, we know, occurs quite a bit from anthropogenic noise and not just in these anti-predator contexts. We know, for example, that many sage grouse um, will avoid particularly noisy areas to do all of their lecking. So they gather in these big groups for the males to kind of show off how amazingly awesome they are. Um, and a lot of um, traditional lecking grounds that these, that these grouse grow to, these grouse go to every spring, um, just they're not going there anymore, which means it's very hard for the females to find the males if they've moved to a new site. Um, and uh, a lot of these signals themselves are being, are being um, masked, so it's just hard to find them in general. Uh, we also know that for many species like oven birds and reed buntings, um, pairing success is much lower in really noisy areas. And we think that this is also a result of covering up these songs. So the females may simply just not be finding the males. We know that this also affects perception of song in birds. So we know that, for example, in great tits, females can't reliably um, assess a male's song or the male's uh, song quality. And if these are, and we know that they are um, honest traits, then suddenly they're they're selecting or they're choosing males that are not based on those honest traits anymore um, because they can't actually assess any part of that trait. We also know that sound can affect communication between parents and offspring. So um, many house sparrows in areas that are incredibly noisy don't necessarily uh, feed their chicks enough. And so the chicks do much more poorly. And we think that this is a result of the parents not being stimulated enough by the begging because part of the begging or all of the begging of the chicks is being masked. And so the parents aren't feeding as much as they should. This massively can change how and when animals also are producing noise. So we know that fin whales, for example, are not only changing the structures of their songs, but they're also changing when they sing them. They're avoiding noisy times, and when noise starts, they tend to stop to avoid having to try to basically shout over vessel traffic. Um, and then finally, we also know this can affect things that have nothing to do with the actual specific communication. We know, for example, that lots of larval reef fish use the noise of all these other animals on the reef communicating to find the reefs. And so when you start covering up this noise or masking this noise in the oceans, suddenly those, those fish can't find the reef and they can't settle. So even just acoustic masking and even just masking of um, acoustic communication has far-reaching consequences potentially in a lot of species' everyday lives. And that's not all that anthropogenic noise does. It's not just masking. So there's a number of direct and indirect effects of anthropogenic noise on various animal species that we know about. So we know, for example, that there tends to be a lot of avoidance. So many different species will avoid noisy areas. Um, and so in those noisy areas, populations will completely change, um, shift, decline in various different ways, depending on which species are avoiding these noisy areas. We know that there's specific mortality that can be caused directly by noise. This includes injury. Um, we know a lot of um, fish, for example, and other underwater uh, organisms, because noise travels so much farther and faster and we can't hear it. So I feel like oftentimes humans don't necessarily consider it. Um, or we can't hear it above water at least. Uh, we know, for example, the pile driving and that type of noise can rupture organs in fish. It can cause changes in behavior in ascending whales. So they ascend too fast and they essentially get the bends um, and then strand. Um, we also know that it can lower predator detection, which can increase um, predator success rate in certain areas quite well. Um, meaning that you're dying because you're being eaten more readily. We know that it can increase chronic stress, which can lower condition, body condition, which can ultimately end in death. Um, and it can also induce hearing loss, which if you have to listen for predator um, sounds can also be very, very bad. And then finally, we know it also affects reproduction. 
So it can affect actual breeding, like in the previous examples, by masking a lot of these calls, you can start actually causing problems with individuals being able to find each other to breed at all. Um, we also know that it can change breeding behavior, so it can reduce display in a lot of species, which means that they're maybe not being as attractive, and so there are fewer females willing to breed with poorly displaying males, for example. Um, and we also know that it can affect juvenile recruitment, not just through poor condition or chronic stress, um, but also through things like uh, improper developments. We know that in many, um, uh, or not many, but in some marine species, larval stages of various crabs and fish can actually basically develop improperly when exposed to too much noise. And then, of course, all of these kind of culminate in these indirect effects, which alter the relationships between species and between species and the spaces that they live in. So we know that it alters detection distance in many, many different species. So suddenly a signal that could go 100 meters can now only go 40 or 50 meters, and suddenly you can't actually stay in connect in connected to those other individuals you need to be staying connected to if they're part of your group that may cause changes in um, territory size or how easy it is to find one another in these particular circumstances. We know it changes spatial distribution through avoidance, um, and so these animals are changing where they are, and that massively then impacts community composition. So for example, we know that owls tend to avoid really noisy areas because they rely on, on hearing to hunt so well, which means you might get a spike in owl populations in other areas, which could then drive um, increased depredation on various species, which can completely change the community composition. So we know that the effects of anthropogenic noise are incredibly far-reaching um, and affect really fundamental processes that can kind of roll into these much bigger problems. And so kind of as a, as a last little thing, I'm going to do a bit of a, not a thought experiment, but a a, what we know, because we know a lot about how animals respond to noise in short term, but we know much, much less about how animals respond to noise in long term and what that actually means for entire community systems. So one of the examples um, that we know happens is that an increase in noise in some species like great tits can actually reduce um, clutch size or clutch success. And so you have fewer chicks born. And what this could potentially end up leading to is general population decline as fewer chicks are being born. And there could be a huge range of effects that this could end up snowballing into. One of them is that this could affect some of their parasites. So blowflies may also start to decline or they may move to a different host um, causing issues there. So you won the decline of one species may then end up knocking on to cause the decline of another species. You may also have situations where if like with the blowflies, if they don't have that species to um, uh, parasitize, predators might be doing the same thing. So if a predator doesn't have suddenly this main source of food that it was using, it may switch to another prey. Um, and that prey may be unused to very heavy um, predation pressures, may end up not doing very well and may also go into decline. You may end up having a situation like with great tits, we do think that they're community informants, so many of these other species may be listening to them and using the information that they're producing to avoid predation. And if that information is suddenly very infrequent or unreliable or just not around because the birds aren't, then suddenly they may also start declining because they're not doing as well, they can't exploit habitats as well, um, they just do more poorly because suddenly they're having to compensate for a particular type of information that they no longer have access to. This can have some positive benefits. We have seen some positive for some species. Um, so with the, with the decline of one species, you may open up foraging opportunities for other species that they compete with, for example. Um, and like we know in some species, as I said, one of the mortality issues is that many species can't detect predators very well. Well, it's potentially great for the predators because <laughs> they're able to eat all of these, all of these other species, at least in the short term. But you can get benefits like being able to expand your range um, or your foraging niche if this other species is much less frequent um, or absent altogether. Um, but on the flip side of that, if you rely on these other species to help you expand your range, 
um, and are, are able to access way more of a microhabitat because these species are there, like in a lot of these mixed species groups with mobbing species in particular, then suddenly your micro um, habitat is, is shrinking and you can exploit a lot less because you're less willing to cross these gaps or um, move around a bit more in your habitat because you have to be so much more vigilant. And then finally, this can change spatial distribution. So if, again, if you have a really important mobbing species like great tits, and they're one of these species that's helping other species and other species in their home ranges um, cross these barriers, then if those species are suddenly absent, those barriers become proper barriers again. And you're not able to cross these barriers and get into new areas and take advantage of all the resources in those areas. So. I guess kind of my, my general take home message is that even though many of the studies that we've been able to do on noise have shown these very short term, bad, but short term kind of effects like lower clutch size or um, slightly lower pairing success in certain areas. If you really start to take a much more global integrated picture of this, you start realizing that even impacting just one or two species in the ecosystem can have catastrophic results, potentially. Um, we know, for example, that affecting one particular bird species has actually caused the um, white bark pine forests to start receding from cities because their seeds are not being planted anymore. And that is affecting every single species that lives in that forest. So. It is this, this thing that I think that we are starting to pay a huge amount of attention to. Um, the marine world in general has been paying way more attention to this for much longer than much of the terrestrial world. Um, but it's something to take into account and really, I think, think about moving forward and trying to understand what the actual repercussions of a lot of these short-term effects in animals in response to noise will end up snowballing into in these wider ecosystems, in these very interconnected um, lives of these animals. So um, yeah, that's me. That is the end of my talk. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, and I will answer them the best that I can. Uh, yes, there is a recording you'll be able to access. It will go up on YouTube um, shortly. I don't know how many days. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure within a week, probably. And thank you. Hi, yes, the, 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 um, the YouTube can, um, I, I'll put the link in for where it'll be and it'll be before Easter. Um, sure. <laughs> I'd be willing to present, um, maybe send me a little bit more information because I am in the West Coast of North America. So timing is a bit exciting. Um, but yeah, I love talking about this. I like getting people interested in the effects of noise on animals because I think it's extraordinarily important. And I think it's something that, um, while I think a lot of people that work with animals and bioacoustics are starting to become very aware of, I think that in the broader popular science and that kind of stuff as well, it's still not very, um, it's not as talked about, I think. And so I always think that it's incredibly um, important. So I'm always willing to talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, so mobbing is, um, it's one of these, so sorry, so the question is um, whether or not mobbing is found in other animals. And um, I think that there is, for some reason, this perception that mobbing, A, has to involve a huge number of animals being incredibly aggressive and like almost killing an animal, um, and B, that it tends to be a huge number of individuals. And um so I think that that perception and also the perception that it's like a bird and maybe mammal kind of thing has caused many people to think that mobbing is a very specialized behavior. 
Um, but the more and more research I've done looking into it, as far as we can tell, I mean, swarming and in insects is basically essentially, I, I consider it mobbing. It is prey harassing and attacking a predator in order to drive it from the area. You see it in fish. So I've talked to many, many divers, um, especially coral reef fish, especially colonially nesting fish. You will get them absolutely attacking, biting predators, trying to get them from an area. Um, I'm sure we can find uh, an amphibian that does it or a reptile that does it. Um, but you, yeah, you see it in insects, you see it in birds, you see it in fish, you see it in mammals, and you see it in many, many, many different species. So um, one of the slightly hard things is that the language around it tends to be not necessarily mobbing when you start looking outside of like the classically mobbing species. So with a lot of fish, for example, the line between predator inspection and mobbing is very poorly described in many because they'll be like, oh yeah, so this fish was like inspecting this predator and then sort of biting it on the fin. And I'm like, that's not inspection. <laughs> that's mobbing. That's definitely mobbing. But a lot of people don't kind of, cons they, they didn't think that mobbing happens in their species. And so they aren't looking for it. Um, so same thing with ungulates, you get a lot of people talking about predator harassment in ungulates, which is mobbing. Um, and so yes, as far as we can tell, it is an, an incredibly common behavior across a wide range of species. Um, aha, oh my god, okay. William, do you think that? Yes, I think so. Fish, we definitely know. Sorry. So fish, we definitely know use mobbing behavior. I really want to study mobbing and fish um, because I think it's fascinating. And I think that fish are like birds in many ways. Um, I'm, I think probably if you have crustaceans that are either territorial enough or do some type of colonial nesting um, that have predators that they can drive away relatively easily, I think that then mobbing would work quite well. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of circumstances or um, that kind of go into making a species, making mobbing a beneficial behavior. Because if you can just hide, then there's no real reason to mob. You're just not going to be found. Or if you can leave, there's no real reason to mob. You can just leave. Um, but for animals that are somewhat territorial, mobbing can potentially be a very effective decision. Um, interesting. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a, an interesting question. So um, uh, this person worked with someone interested in how the sound propagation environment influenced uh, bird behavior, in this case, coated crows, for example, how they could exploit it. Um, so yeah, so it, it we think that, that um, I think it depends on how they would exploit that information. So if they exploit the actual information, in terms of sound propagation and how it propagates in an environment, then yeah, noise absolutely disrupts that. If they can adjust to that noise though, then they may actually be able to exploit it even better if other animals can't adjust to changes in noisy environments in general. So if they're able to find some channel that they can either communicate in really effectively, um, or if they just are able to adjust how they communicate, but they know that other animals that they're exploiting can't adjust and they can't communicate the same way, then they may, may be able to, for example, communicate about a potential prey item or a potential food source that they can exploit without having to compete with other individuals because those other individuals can't get that signal out to whatever um, uh, conspecifics, for example, might also be competing for that food source. So you might get a situation like that. Um, if, however, they can't adjust for any type of noise, then it's just kind of, I think, things like detection just end up being more limited. And so they may be just as constrained as other animals. I don't know if that was particularly clear answer, um, but that's a very, very intriguing point. Um, Ah, so, okay, so the question is, um, has your research considered what the noise limits from anthropogenic noise might be for different sources? I've come across limits of 55 LA max being um, used for marine birds from construction noise. So I know that many, especially in the marine world, there are 
um, noise limits that they're trying to impose if they can, because they know that anything above a certain noise amount will cause physical damage. So for example, that's like why there's a lot of the bubble curtains that, that people will use around pile driving as they're trying to dampen and absorb a lot of that noise before it can spread too far. Um, I think in most marine mammals, for example, I believe the kind of like for short periods of time, acceptable noise limit, limit is like up to 140 decibels or something similar because anything over that and you're doing long-term permanent damage to their hearing or their bodies. Um, and, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure yet about how the kind of interface between actual limits and rules and regulations and how things are specifically affecting different animals um, are constructed. Uh, I know that I'm sure many of the scientists are like, no, it should be lower. And a lot of the people that are using a lot of these um, noise producing uh, important machinery and equipment are like, well, we can't actually limit the noise that much. So um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, So um, one of the questions is that we're starting to understand the negative consequences of noise pollution, um, but do we know, do I know any about any proposed solutions to the problem of anthropogenic noise? So I think, um, I think that, um, I know that there are solutions to so things like bubble curtains. We know, for example, that if you engineer a propeller of ships just right for that ship, you can decrease the noise that they produce massively. Also, if you update a lot of the machinery inside the ship, so a lot of parts of the um, engine room and just the general running of the ship, the better maintained it is, usually the less noisy it is because there's less things rattling around and clunking together. Um, I think a huge amount of noise in many situations are not necessarily what we really think of the noise coming from because like that was one of the things that I was really surprised by with ships is that like propellers are a problem because the cavitation so the exploding bubbles are actually what causes the majority of the noise of like a lot of the propeller noise but there's a huge amount of vibration that comes um, from the actual engine and various machines inside the ship vibrating the hull of the ship that goes out into the water and so those noises, just machine noises, also end up being a huge part of why ships make noise. Um, and I think that more and more people are looking into more feasible solutions. So instead of, you know, completely changing how we do ships, trying to figure out well, how can we maintain them in such a way as to make sure they're producing as little noise as feasibly possible. Um, and again, with things like bubble curtains, um, around pile driving, if you have like one line of bubble curtains, that's pretty good. If you have two lines of bubble curtains, which are basically, which you guys did not explain bubble curtains, you have a pile that's being hit into the ground. Um, and then what you'll do is down at the bottom, you have like a tube that basically just releases bubbles. It's like little tiny bubbles in kind of a curtain. Um, and if you have two of them because of the sound waves having to transfer, first of all, they're, they're scattering off of the actual bubbles. Um, but it basically just, it creates an, an acoustic curtain essentially. And so if you have one layer, you get a pretty big reduction. If you have two layers, you have a massive reduction in um, sound, but then you have problems of like, well, what if the current is running? Then it's actually pushing the bubbles away from the pile. So I know that, that people are definitely looking at very specific types of solutions that they can implement. I know that, for example, people have used for a really long time, especially in residential areas, the kind of curved sides to highways and stuff to help trap some of the noise in the highway and not let it, let it get out into the residential area. I'm sure there are better ways to engineer as those, but again, most of the solutions are costly. And so you're kind of fighting against that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I think with the birds, so um, one person wrote that they're particularly interested in the effects on birds and 55 LA max seems very low. So I think that part of the problem is that it depends on the species. It depends on what the noise is doing to the species. So in some species, it may be issues like masking where you are just causing it very to be very difficult for individuals to communicate, which could cause all sorts of problems like lowered breeding rates um, because birds simply aren't finding each other. You could cause decreases in 
uh, chick survivorship if the parents aren't feeding the chicks because they aren't hearing the begging. But it could also be completely different reasons. It could be changing their relationship with predators. So suddenly you're covering up what were already very quiet noises. So maybe the way that they detect certain predators is they're hearing them walk near their nest in the night. And if they can't hear this predator walking across the ground, they can't escape the predator. And so you're not necessarily just looking at noises that are incredibly important for the animal that are loud noises the animal are making, but they might be covering up quiet noises that the animals still rely on to survive. It also could be that the noise itself is causing problems. So it's not that it's masking anything, it's that it's increasing stress rates massively, that you're producing a certain type of noise in the environment and all of a sudden you see glucocoid syrup, uh, you basically see stress hormones just skyrocket in certain animals. And if that's happening, you may just need really, really low levels of noise as a maximum because you're so concerned about rising those stress levels and how that may impact the animal survival. So I think that there's never going to be one solution for any of these species and different species tolerate noise very differently and for very different reasons. And so it could be that the noise level isn't so much because you're masking something. It might be because when the, when the animals, these birds hear noise, they are suddenly having massive stress responses to this noise or this particular type of noise. Um, one of the things I've always been really interested by is most of our alarm systems, um, fire alarms, any of that kind of stuff, are very, very high frequency. And they are right within that frequency range of bird aerial alarm calls. So alarm calls that birds are giving specifically when predators are attacking them. And so it might also be the quality of the noise. It might be a noise in a certain frequency range could massively increase anti-predator responses in ways that they actually shouldn't be responding. Um, and so thereby completely changing their behavior or increasing stress in a different way as well. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so one of the questions is whether there's a frequency weighting that's used to assess noise level. Um, oh no. Uh, so with humans, there's uh, there's usually this A weighting. <clears throat> I think with many, I think with many species like birds, A weighting probably is something that's used because it's very similar to us. Their hearing is quite similar to us, although it they hear faster. Um, and they can differentiate between frequencies better than most of us, or at least uh, I think most songbirds can. I think a lot of times, one of the things that a lot of people start doing when they start getting really concerned about noise <clears throat> and communication, especially in animals, is what they'll do is they'll do audio, they'll make audiograms for the animals to try to understand what their own kind of neurological weighting is for a lot of these or filtering is for a lot of these um, different frequencies. And so, for example, the audiogram of a dolphin, of course, is going to be way higher frequency than us, but they might not have a lot of the lower frequency stuff, or they might not even be able to hear at all some of the lower frequency stuff that we can. Um, and for lots of fish, for example, they can hear a lot of really low frequency stuff, frequency stuff we can barely hear, but they can't hear any of the high frequency stuff we can. So there is waiting usually when taking, when, when you're considering noise for a particular species. A lot of times you're trying to match that noise to its communication channel in, in its frequency range, as well as its ability to detect noise in particular frequency ranges. But when you're looking kind of across the broad spectrum in terms of doing just um, a kind of a noise analysis um, for an entire area, regardless of species, I think they tend to look kind of just unweighted maybe. Um, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't actually done a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. And then, yeah, so <clears throat> um, one of the comments is that it is really important for acousticians to work closely with ecologists to understand what aspects of the sounds, either temporal or spectral content, intermittency, are causing the effect and which should lead to better noise limits and mitigation solutions. And I think that this is really important. So one of the things that I've found really interesting when I started, because I'm kind of shifting slightly to working in marine environments, so I'm, I'm actually going to hopefully next week um, be starting a project on noise and fish. And um, one of the things when I started to look a little bit more into the noise literature that I was really surprised by is that oftentimes solutions for one species are terrible for another. So there's all of these uh, in, in a lot of um, uh, fish farms. 
and areas where they don't want seals or, or, or um, dolphins or whales, <clears throat> they will sometimes employ these kind of scarer noises. They'll just make these noises that these animals don't like. And they tend to be noises that are in this, they're not, I think for the ones for pinnipeds, oftentimes they're in the noise area that pinnipeds hear really well, which are seals and sea lions, but they're not ones that will bother like dolphins or killer whales very much. <clears throat> but one of the other problems is they overlap really well with fish communication. And so <clears throat> there's like currently there's a huge amount of concern about marine mammals and marine mammal communication. And we're just starting to understand how many fish are actually affected by noise and how many fish communicate. It's a huge variety of fish make all sorts of noises. They're incredibly noisy. Um, and so since a lot of this research and a lot of this concern has been put on marine mammals, we're only now starting to be a lot more concerned about fish and realizing that some of the areas that we're looking at for marine mammals are not really applicable to fish because fish tend to hear at such lower frequency levels than a lot of marine mammals. Um, and so it's been <clears throat> really interesting in trying to kind of see that there is really no good one individual fits all kind of solution that you have many different animals in these ecosystems that are specifically adapted to very specific frequency ranges and communication channels. And um, yeah, so it's kind of whatever species you're looking at, usually you need to tailor whatever type of solution you are to a particular species or a particular species group. <clears throat> Anyways, yes, the Q&A are disappearing. <laughs> Um, so I think we might be done, unless there's any more questions. Thank you very, very much for your time, Laura. That's been uh, very, very well received. Thank you very much. Oh, another one in the q and I think. Okay, I'm going to stop my share. Oh, yes, we've had people, <laughs> people are thanking you, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, um, again, thanks very much. And uh, yes, to everybody else, we will be putting the uh, webinar on the YouTube channel, uh, the, the You Can You channel, uh, BB, if not tomorrow, then Thursday. Um, and once again, thanks very much, Nora. And if you, when you're ready, if you can and end the end the uh, webinar for us. Okay. Awesome. Thank well, you. thank you all Take very care. much for listening. And goodbye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.